It is estimated that over half of all known molecules are organic compounds, which means they are carbon-based. And virtually all organic compounds are formed from elements that adhere to the octet and duet rule. Therefore, we can take a slightly different approach when drawing Lewis structures for organic compounds. Common elements within organic compounds are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Examining the Lewis dot structures for these atoms tell us how many valence electrons are present and how many are needed for full valency. For example, nitrogen has five valence electrons and will need three more for an octet. It will gain these three additional electrons by forming three covalent bonds. Remember, each time a bond is formed, an atom has access to an additional electron. Thus, if an atom needs n electrons for full valency, it will form n bonds. Let's start our alternative approach to drawing Lewis structures by examining ethane, C2H6. Each carbon has four valence electrons and needs four more electrons for full valency. Thus, it will do this by forming four bonds. Each hydrogen atom has one electron and needs one more. Thus, it will form one bond. Notice that when we are drawing the atoms, we are keeping the appropriate number of valence electrons associated with each atom. After the carbons are connected, we see that each carbon needs three more bonds. Placing three hydrogen atoms on each carbon atom forms the four bonds necessary for each carbon to obtain full valency. In the next example, ethene, C2H4, has two fewer hydrogen atoms. Thus, when we try a similar approach, we find that full valency for the carbon atoms has not been achieved. Each carbon now only has seven electrons. However, pulling the two electrons down so that they form the second bond does give full valency, or the required four bonds for each carbon atom. In our last step, we redraw the final structure to get atoms as far apart from each other as possible. Think of this as the atoms attempting to minimize repulsions. It is worth noting that this final step will be done for all subsequent examples, if necessary. A similar approach is needed for acetylene, C2H2. Again, we see that the only way full valency can be achieved is to bring down electrons for additional bonds between carbons. The double bond brings the atoms closer to full valency, seven electrons around each carbon atom. Therefore, if we bring down the second set of electrons to form a triple bond between the carbon atoms, full valency has been achieved, which is four bonds for each carbon atom. Using this same approach for C3H6 means we first connect all of the carbon atoms. When we attach all of the hydrogen atoms, we realize we are short two hydrogens. Thus, we can swing two electrons down to form a double bond, and we have drawn a solution to the molecular formula. However, if we place two hydrogens on each of the carbons, we can draw another solution by swinging the two end carbons down to form a cyclic structure. A quick check shows that each carbon now has four bonds or full valency. These two structures share the same molecular formula, but different gross connectivity, and are called structural or constitutional isomers. In addition, structural isomers have different chemical and physical properties. Before proceeding, it is worth our efforts to learn about degrees of unsaturation. A fully saturated hydrocarbon follows the CN H2N plus 2 formula, where N is an integer. For example, C2H6 is fully saturated. Recall that when we assembled the Lewis structure, there was enough hydrogen atoms to give full valency for each carbon. However, C2H4 is short two hydrogens, and we say it has one degree of unsaturation which fits the general formula CnH2n. In addition, C3H6 had one degree of unsaturation, 
which also fits the CnH2n formula. Therefore, if a degree of unsaturation exists, one can introduce a double bond or a ring. The C2H2 example fits the CnH2n minus 2 formula for two degrees of unsaturation. Two degrees of unsaturation are satisfied by a triple bond, two double bonds, a double bond and a ring, or two rings. Looking down the general formula column, we see that each time a degree of unsaturation is introduced, two fewer hydrogen atoms are present. Calculating degrees of unsaturation for a given molecular formula helps us develop a logical plan before drawing Lewis structures. Examining the molecular formula for C3H4, we see that there are two degrees of unsaturation, which means we can have a triple bond, or a ring and a double bond, or two double bonds within the carbon skeleton. However, we do not have enough carbons to form two rings. The minimum requirement for two rings is four carbons. With our carbon skeletons assembled, we can simply place the four remaining hydrogen atoms on each of our structures to give four bonds to each carbon. Thus, there are three structural isomers possible for C3H4. It is worth mentioning that the three solutions were obtained quite easily by first deducing the degrees of unsaturation. Interestingly, the cyclic compound with the double bond fits our set of rules. However, it is too strained to exist at room temperature and can be eliminated. For C4H8, we calculate that there is one degree of unsaturation, which means we should try and draw solutions with a double bond or a ring. After connecting all four carbons, we see that we can introduce a double bond between carbon one and two, or between carbon two and three. Placing the remaining eight hydrogen atoms on our carbon skeletons yields two structural isomers. Now let's set out creating solutions which incorporate a ring. With the four carbons attached, we can create a three or four membered ring. Attaching the remaining eight hydrogen atoms to these cyclic compounds yields two more structural isomers. However, upon closer examination, we can also draw one additional structure, a geometric isomer. Geometric isomers have the same gross connectivity, but differ only how the groups are oriented in space due to hindered rotation about the doubly bonded carbons. In addition, they also have different chemical and physical properties. When we draw an imaginary line along the axis of the double bond, and then compare groups on each side using the kahn ingold prelog sequence rules, we can determine if the groups of priority are on opposite sides, called the trans isomer, which is often abbreviated E. Alternatively, the groups of priority can be on the same side of the imaginary line called the cis isomer, often abbreviated Z. Therefore, a pair of geometric isomers is possible for one of our solutions, which afford a total of five solutions. Now let's begin to examine increasingly more complicated organic molecules. For example, C2H6O. Oxygen has six valence electrons, thus it will want to make two bonds to gain full valency. Either two single bonds, or a double bond if a degree of unsaturation exists within the given molecular formula. Ignoring the oxygen for a moment, we have previously seen the solution for C2H6, and there are no degrees of unsaturation. Thus, there will be no degrees of unsaturation for C2H6O, which means the oxygen can only form two single bonds and not a double bond. 
Simply inserting the oxygen atom between the two carbons yields one solution, dimethyl ether. Notice that all atoms have full valency, and as a quick check, we see that each carbon has four bonds. Each hydrogen atom has one bond, and oxygen has two bonds. We can also insert the oxygen between a carbon-hydrogen bond to yield a solution, ethanol. At this point, it is important to understand equivalent hydrogen atoms. In this example, all six hydrogen atoms are equivalent. We can prove this by inserting the oxygen between a different carbon-hydrogen bond. When we do this, we see that the two compounds have the same gross connectivity and are superimposable. Thus, we can create two structural isomers when inserting the oxygen atom. When dealing with saturated organic compounds that contain oxygen, it is often more convenient to first ignore the oxygen, draw all possible solutions, and then insert the oxygen to yield unique isomers. Now let's apply all of these concepts to C3H6O. Ignoring the oxygen, we calculate one degree of unsaturation, which means we can have a double bond or a ring. We first set out to draw all of these solutions, ignoring the oxygen atom, a double bond, and a three-membered ring. Utilizing all six remaining hydrogen atoms yields two intermediate solutions. Now we play the oxygen insertion game to yield as many structural isomers as possible. We see that we can insert the oxygen atom at five unique sites within the intermediate solution with the double bond. Note that the last two compounds are geometric isomers. And we can insert the oxygen at two unique sites within the cyclic intermediate solution. In addition, we can construct a three-membered ring with the oxygen atom. With one degree of unsaturation, we can also have a double bond between an oxygen atom and a carbon atom. Remember, oxygen forms two bonds to obtain full valency, either two single bonds as shown within the previous solutions, or a double bond if a degree of unsaturation exists. Thus, we should connect all three carbon atoms, followed by adding a double bond oxygen at all possible sites to account for the degree of unsaturation. At carbon one, and at carbon two, which yield two more structural isomers after the hydrogen atoms are attached. Therefore, a total of 10 structural isomers can be formed. It is worth mentioning that our logical stepwise approach affords all possible isomers, while a hit and miss approach may have missed one or more of these solutions. Another common element used when drawing organic Lewis structures is sulfur. Because sulfur is in the same family as oxygen, it also has six valence electrons. Therefore, it can be treated in the same manner as oxygen. For example, if we were to draw all the Lewis structures for C3H6S, we use the same approach as we did for C3H6O. Ignore the sulfur, calculate the degree of unsaturation, draw intermediate solutions ignoring the sulfur atom, play the sulfur insertion game, And if there was at least one degree of unsaturation, we would draw double bond sulfur carbon compounds to yield all the possible structural isomers. Now let's look at organic compounds that have nitrogen in their molecular formula. Recall that nitrogen has five valence electrons and needs three more. Thus, it will form three bonds, either three single bonds, a single bond and a double bond, or a triple bond, depending on the degree of unsaturation. When drawing structural isomers for C2H7N, we will first connect the two carbon atoms and nitrogen atom. There are two possibilities. Now we see that seven hydrogen atoms are required for full saturation, which is how many we have. If you add a nitrogen atom to the formula, you need to add an additional hydrogen atom for full saturation.
When drawing the structural isomers for C2H5N, we will first connect the two carbon atoms and nitrogen atom. Again, there are two possibilities. As we have already seen, seven hydrogen atoms are required for full saturation. However, we are short two hydrogen atoms, which is one degree of unsaturation. Thus, we can incorporate a double bond or a ring. We will begin our logical approach to this problem by introducing a double bond to afford three unique intermediates, or a ring to both of these carbon-nitrogen skeletons. After adding the remaining five hydrogen atoms, four unique structural isomers are easily afforded. Again, all of the solutions were obtained quite easily by first calculating one degree of unsaturation, which helps us develop a logical plan before drawing Lewis structures. Understanding why bonds form and what types of bonds will form between the various atoms is essential when studying chemistry. And with a little practice, your ability to draw structural isomers can be mastered. This DVD was created entirely by the student for the student at Cushing Academy.